Good morning. It is 10 o'clock Eastern. I'm Ana Cabrera reporting from New York. And today, the seat of our government prepares for the arraignment of the 45th president of the United States. Donald Trump called to appear at a district courthouse tomorrow in Washington to face four federal counts, including three conspiracies to defraud this country and subvert Americans' right to vote. Special counsel Jack Smith's 45-page indictment details repeated and exhaustive efforts by Trump to stay in power, a pressure campaign that involved attorneys and campaign operatives, and lists six unindicted co-conspirators that prosecutors allege supported Trump's efforts to overturn an election. We will take you through all of this with NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Candelanian at the DOJ. Also with us, former Assistant Manhattan District Attorney Catherine Christian, former FBI Assistant Director Frank Figluzzi, and former Federal and State Prosecutor Tali Farhadian Weinstein. Thank you all for being here. Ken, first, lay out how this proceeds from here. What can we expect with this arraignment tomorrow? Good morning, Anna. Well, we got a great preview when Donald Trump was arraigned in the documents case in Miami. There's a lot of drama uh, surrounding the buildup, but in actual fact, the proceeding is pretty staid and boring, and Trump says very little. He'll be, this will be both a first appearance before a judge in this case and an arraignment, and uh, he will be asked to answer for the charges. He'll be, he'll be asked how he pleads. The charges will be presented to him, and there may be some procedural issues discussed. Uh, although this is a magistrate judge, not the actual judge in the case. And so uh, those things like what T Trump can say about the case and who he can talk to, some of that may be reserved for his first, first appearance before the actual judge. Uh, but nonetheless, high drama, uh, as we expect to see Donald Trump appear in this courthouse a few blocks from me tomorrow. And so you mentioned this magistrate judge will oversee the arraignment, but then it's Judge Tanya Chutkin who will be in charge of the trial and the case moving forward. What do we know about her? Judge Chuckin was appointed to the bench in 2013 by President Barack Obama. She's got an interesting background. She was born in Jamaica. She spent time as a public defender in Washington, D.C., not a common background for a federal judge. She was also a corporate lawyer. And interestingly, she's the only judge in D.C. who's actually uh, sentenced January 6th defendants, the, the violent uh, rioters convicted in those cases beyond what prosecutors have asked for. In other words, to, to stiffer sentences than prosecutors have asked for. And she also ruled in an important case in 2021 against Donald Trump, requiring that he had to turn over hundreds of documents to the committee investigating the January 6th riot. Tali, I know you've read through the indictment like the rest of us. Jack Smith obviously paid attention to the details. He really paints a picture here. He lays bare all of his evidence. Maybe not all of it, but a lot of it. Contemporaneous notes taken by former Vice President Pence, numerous accounts from people directly involved. This all culminating in four charges here. One obstruction charge, uh, three conspiracy charges. Why the three conspiracy charges? Are they distinctly different? Uh, they are distinctly different, Anna. First, let me say, uh, you know, I agree with you that it, this indictment is readable and worth reading, like the Mar-a-Lago indictment. It's clearly written uh, to be read by the American public. And I think that uh, the three charges are very different, the conspiracies. And the one that I find particularly interesting is the conspiracy to deprive people of their rights, because I think that that one has enormous jury appeal in explaining why this prosecution is happening, why the alleged conduct was so harmful to our system of government. Catherine, let's listen to what Trump's attorney had to say earlier this morning. And this indictment is criminalizing conduct, not speech. No, it's criminalizing speech for this reason. What the president saw in the 2020 election was all these irregularities going on. He had every right to comment on that and act politically. In a criminal case, what they would have to show is all of that speech was not entitled to First Amendment production. But we're not Protection. talking about They'll speech. They'll never be able to do it. It's, it's very explicit. Political it says, though, Jack Smith speech. saw that. Catherine, what do you make of this? Well, I saw him on a, a different network saying, basically, there's a smoking gun of innocence. So what the defense is going to be, what my client said was all protected speech. The false electors and all of those false certifications, I had nothing to do with it. And I was given advice, and I think uh, his lawyer referred to John Eastman as a eminent legal scholar. He dropped John Eastman's name a mm. number of times. So it's going to be, he's throwing these co-conspirators under the bus. That's what Donald Trump is going to do. 
what I said I own, but what was happening in those states, and he didn't visit the states, it was co-conspirator number one, Rudy Giuliani, who was doing all of that. And then he'll say, and I'm again thinking he's a defense attorney, they reported back to me, and then I tweeted it because I believe what they told me. Yeah, I was actually really surprised, though, in the indictment to read that while it was Rudy Giuliani, co-conspirator one, who's unidentified by name in this indictment, that it wasn't just him, that Trump was actually involved at a pretty granular level with Giuliani, with other co-conspirators in communicating with different people throughout this scheme that's alleged in the indictment. And, and so, Tali, when you take a look at everyone who told Trump that his claims were just false, Mike Pence, senior leaders at the Justice Department, director of national intelligence, CISA, White House attorneys, senior staffers on Trump's reelection campaign, state legislators, the courts. I mean, the list is extensive here. You also had the deputy White House counsel telling Trump, quote, there is no option in which you do not leave the White House on January 20th. So this sort of willful ignorance that he, you know, maybe believed his own lies, that he was being led astray by these other co-conspirators who are lawyers. Is that a strong defense? Well, uh, clearly, the special counsel anticipated uh, this line of defense that he believed everything that he was saying and he believed he had won the election. And uh, right at the top, as you say, it it refutes that as a question of fact. I mean, it is a question of fact, and it's going to have to be resolved. But there's a ton of evidence in here, as you've suggested, that says that his people told him all along and at every step of the way that his those beliefs that they were putting out there were false. And so uh, I think it's going to be hard to sustain that line of defense. Frank, Trump was charged with conspiracy and obstruction, but Jack Smith stayed away from charging him directly with the violence on January 6th. Are you surprised by that? At first, initially, Anna, I was disappointed in my first read through, and then I realized that the violence at the Capitol is very much a part of this indictment. It's not set aside yet and charged separately. But it, the violence becomes a fulcrum to leverage the big lie into some kind of pressure against Pence, into action against Congress. It's in there throughout. And what's really disturbing are the passages in the indictment that show us how cavalierly the co-conspirators and Donald Trump were treating the likelihood of violence. There was a comment in there by a co-conspirator, hey, that's why we have an insurrection act. When somebody said, well, there's going to be riots in the street if you continue this attempt to defraud people and, and steal the legitimate vote, there's going to be violence in the street. Yeah, that's why we have an insurrection act. They seem prepared to invoke the insurrection act, which means putting military troops on the streets, calling out a militia, all of that they were perfectly fine with. So the violence is in there. So, so why wasn't Trump charged then with the insurrection? Why do you think that is? So uh, th we've heard already the mantra of, hey, this was all free speech, free speech. So if you start getting into the speech at the ellipse, the morning of January 6th, and you get into parsing, you know, commas and comments and who, who incited violence and was this inferred or implied by the crowd or not, you really start a protracted uh, process of, of battling the free speech issue. I think masterfully, Smith has stayed away from that battle and said, look, this was the result of what you did. It was part of your big lie, part of your defrauding the United States people. So he incorporates the gravity of it to really uh, encompass the totality of what he is alleging here. And then, Ken, there are these six unnamed, unindicted co-conspirators. That's interesting. What do we know about them and why unnamed and uncharged? So we can only theorize, because Jack Smith's not talking, but it really does appear that he brought a streamlined case against only Donald Trump in an effort to try to get this thing to trial before the election, because he knows that if Donald Trump wins the election, this case could go away. And so that doesn't mean these people won't be charged. We're talking about Rudy Giuliani, who's already lost his law license over making bogus claims of fraud in court. Uh, we're talking about John Eastman, who advised 
President Trump on the false elector scheme, and Jeffrey Clark, uh, AKA in the indictment co-conspirator number four, who made that Insurrection Act comment according to the indictment, and who had a plan to use the Justice Department to declare fraud, which perhaps was one of the most dangerous aspects of this whole plot uh, and is charged in this indictment. A man named Kenneth Cheesebro, who was, uh, is reputed to be the father of the fake elector scheme. So they're all in there, and they participated in the conspiracy according to the indictment. These are allegations, of course, but they are not charged. That doesn't mean they won't be charged at a later date, Donna. So many more questions that we're going to continue to discuss throughout the hour. Kendalani and uh, Frank Fergluzzi, Tali Farhadi and Weinstein, and Catherine Christian. Thanks to all of you, Catherine. Stay close.